So, once again, I'd like to welcome you all, dear friends. The topic of today's session deals with counteracting corruption in business. So, we believe that this approach is rather new with us because in the Russian Federation, over the last decade, the development of corruption mechanisms was mostly in the area of civil service. And starting with 08, legislation and practice worked in this direction. But of late, we have been dealing with corruption as business uh, as well. I think that there are people here who know about the latest national plan of counteracting corruption uh, signed by the president recently. And this plan focuses on, on business and corruption. So I believe that this uh, meeting, this session, will be of great use to us because we can exchange our experience and we can elaborate our common approaches. Another point of importance is as follows. Various sociological surveys show that all the attempts by the state certainly are productive in a way, and there is a sustainable trend towards reducing the scope of corruption in the Russian Federation, and I can illustrate it by statistics. According to a number of surveys, the shadow turnover in 2013, as compared to 2011, went down by one trillion rubles, while in 2011, experts believed that it was about 2 trillion rubles in the shadow turnover. Now it's much lower. And the other figures also show the risk index to be in a corrupted situation and so on. So there are a lot of indi indicators which prove that there is a sustainable trend towards reducing corruption, which is a result of all of us, and not only of the government. So I'd like to thank all the colleagues who have come here. And in particular, I'd like to thank the speakers who are will speak today, and in particular, our guests, who have come a long way to be present here. We have people from various states here, and in the course of the discussion, they will speak on various issues and will describe the approaches. So I think that we shall base our work on the following principles. I am a liberal by nature, but time is an objective category. So we would like to focus our presentations on the provisions or on the developments which are unique for the speaker, which are not known to others, because we all are aware about, well, as far as corruption goes, we know what it's all about. But we would rather discuss the measures to reduce corruption in business. So I'd, I'd like to request the speakers to cope with a time limit of 10 minutes focusing on the major issues because we'll have discussion, comments, and questions at the end of the session. Also, we should take into account the fact that we have a long list of speakers and all of you have interesting ideas and perspectives. So opening the discussion, opening the session as a liberal, I'd like to put a question to the speakers. Who is ready to start voluntarily? Who is ready to share the experience? Please, you have the floor, sir. My name is Edward Davis. I'm from Miami, Florida and I am the current chair of the International Bar Association Subcommittee on Asset Recovery in Corruption Cases. So you might, and I'm a civil lawyer. I am a, a litigator, 
So you might ask yourself, why is a litigator sitting on a panel on corruption? And I hope by the end of my 10 minutes, you'll understand why a civil litigator is on a panel on corruption. First, again, I thank uh, all of the, the panelists and, and the organization for inviting me here to speak. I was asked to speak on a few questions. I want to start with the first one. I don't have the clicker, but uh, hopefully they can uh, advance the, uh, does somebody have the, uh... ah, thank you. The first question I was asked to talk about was the cause of corruption. Well, the causes of corruption are fairly obvious in some cases. Number one, the cause of corruption is greed, the love of money, above other things. Two, hunger for power. And three, I think one that's not obvious is the disparity in the economic wealth of corporations in, a, in, a, in the world today. If you look at some of the numbers I've put up on the screen, these are 2010 numbers. Um, it is amazing the amount of economic power that some of the world's largest corporations have. If you just look at Walmart's, Walmart alone, their annual revenue is in excess of the GDP of 168 countries. These are corporations that have their own air forces, if you will. They have their own fleets. They have the legions of lawyers, literally legions. I think General Electric has 800 lawyers that focus on taxes alone, just on tax issues, just to give you an idea of the economic power. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. That is a fact. But when you have that kind of economic disparity and you put a commercial actor, a business, because we're, the focus of this panel is how does business relate to corruption, in the end you're dealing with two sides of the equation. The supply side of the equation, and that is from business, and the demand side of the equation, and that is the people who are asking for the bribes. And in my opinion, the, and I'll tell you, give you some numbers to support it, you cannot solve the corruption problem by simply focusing on compliance. You have to take the money out of the process. You have to take the assets away from those who are engaging in corrupt acts. If you don't do that, they're going to keep doing it. Just to give you the one statistic, Nigeria, their two, 2010 GDP, and I bring up Nigeria because it suffered massive corruption uh, in the, just the Abacha case alone. And recently there's a $500 million recovery of assets. Their GDP um, is, if, if you just compare it, uh, there's seven corporations with revenue larger than, la annual revenue larger than Nigeria's annual GDP. So I think this is one of the, one of the causes of corruption, the causes. We have to think uh, about basic human nature when we talk about corruption. So then we talk about the cost of corruption. What is the cost? This is a very hard thing to measure because how do you measure the person who dies because the road wasn't built or because the hospital wasn't built. How do you measure that? How do you actually put a metric on the fact that schools weren't built because people stole money from the education budget and an entire generation of children is undereducated? How do you measure that? Well, it's hard to measure. It's very difficult. But what you can measure is the amount that the World Bank figures is stolen every year or losses to, due to corruption, and they estimate between 800 billion and two trillion dollars a year. So let's just, I'm gonna come back to this number in just a minute. Let's just estimate that we have one trillion dollars a year annually lost in, annually, globally, uh, in corruption losses. Let's move on. I'm not gonna spend too much time on some of these slides, but I will send them to you if you want them if you give me your email address. But I just want to walk through. You can see I've put here just a list of various reports, very small, hard to read, but various reports that objectively look at measuring the amount of, uh, of corruption in dollars on an annual basis. But the other part of corruption is what about the pain to the individual citizens? How do you measure unfulfilled promises? In the, in the end, government is about making pro delivering on the promises it makes to the people. If it can't deliver on those promises, it's fair to ask questions, why are those promises not being met? And I think one of the questions we don't ask is, why should we care? 
Why is it relevant that we look at corruption? Because I, I will tell you that in my opinion, the problem is that when you don't look at corruption, when you don't stop corruption, you create apathy in the population. A sense of hopelessness, a lack of drive, uh, a lack of initiative. You also create laziness in the, in, in the business world. There's a laziness created because you know you can cheat to get the contract, so you don't put your best work forward, but you don't have to put the best effort into it. And what happens when the bridges collapse, or the dams collapse, or the schools are not built properly, or the nuclear power plant has five-foot walls instead of ten-foot walls because we, we took away concrete because we had to make up the difference somewhere else. So that's a very important part of the business side of, of uh, corruption. How do you, uh, why do you want to stop it? Because the government needs a reason. Otherwise, we just let it go, we, we ignore it, we just factor it in as part of our life. But in the end, it creates a downward spiral a lack of quality in a society if you allow corruption to just go untouched. Now, I went to law school. I was a science major, but I went to law school ultimately because I was very bad at math. So I would like you to, to bear with me. Um, I think one of our problems with the current model is it doesn't work, and I'm going to illustrate that to you financially. The, the World Bank estimates, as we said, about a trillion dollars in losses a year. The World Bank also has measured and kept track of the amount of collections and assets that have been recovered from that trillion dollars. And it's about five billion dollars over the last 20 years total. So if you take a trillion dollars times 20 years, that's 20 trillion dollars. That's the total amount of losses in corruption over the past 20 years. And we've recovered five billion dollars. So I'm not good at math, as I told you. If we divide the 20 by half, and say that it was overmeasured, it's $10 trillion. That's a conservative thing to do. This is, I know you started out by saying, Mr. Chairman, you're liberal, but let's be conservative when it comes to the numbers. $20 trillion. And let's say the $5 billion is undermeasured as well, and we'll double that to $10, $10 billion in recoveries over the last 20 years. That means we have $20 trillion of corruption losses versus $10 billion of collections or recoveries in the last 20 years. That means you have a 0.001% recovery rate. So whatever we've been doing for the last 20 years doesn't work objectively. The measurements, those numbers simply don't lie. It means that you, can, you have a 99.99% chance of keeping everything you steal or everything you get from corruption. Now what else can you do in your life that has a 99.999% chance of, of succeeding? Very little, I would suggest. So what is the current model and why, and I know I'm coming up on the end of my time. The problem with the current model is it's myopically focused on the criminal process. It simply uses the criminal process. And there are all kinds of reasons why the criminal process um, doesn't work as well as we would like, especially when you're doing transnational requests between countries. Even though we have treaties, even though we have good intent, and when countries try, like through conferences like this, to meet each other and to become friendly and cooperate with each other, it's very difficult for the criminal process for two reasons. Number one, you are, you, there's a political element to it. So you're asking another government to assist you, number one. And there's always issues when you have another government involved. And number two, the, the problem with, with the criminal process is it's focused on putting people in jail. And it's very good at that. Generally speaking, it's very good at that. But it's not very good at bringing in restitution for the victims of the crime. And so it, the, the tool it uses, it's like trying to open a can of beans with a screwdriver. It works. You can do it. But it's not a very pretty thing, and it doesn't work very well. The better tool, I would suggest to you, are civil proceedings. And my colleague, Stephen Baker, is going to talk about a civil proceeding on behalf of the Brazilian government. I won't go into it. Um, I'll skip those slides uh, on, on, on this issue, because uh, he'll cover it off when he deals with how successful when it is when governments hire private civil asset recovery teams. Now, what is a civil asset recovery team? It's important to remember 
that one of the biggest ways that you get value back for your clients in a corruption case, and I said value, not assets, because the theory in the treaties, the UNCAC treaty, the OECD treaty, is that there is some asset out there that you can go find, and this asset can be attached, and, be, and, bring, and you can bring it back. Many times the assets are gone. They've spent the money, or they've moved it along, but what you can do is sue the people who assisted the bad actor. You can sue the banks, the lawyers, the accountants, and the others who facilitated the crime, facilitated the, the fraud. And that is a very powerful way of getting your client made whole. And I have represented governments, three different governments, and in all of those cases, we have used civil cases, not criminal cases, to bring the money back uh, to them. So the premise, and the premise I'm suggesting and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being told I'm done, and I'll leave it at this. The premise I'm suggesting for discussion purposes um, is that we have a civil asset recovery paradigm, civil asset recovery teams of lawyers, accountants, and, and forensic accountants and investigators that work for governments to bring the assets back home. And with that, uh, I will uh, turn it back over to the chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much for your uh, being courageous. It's always difficult to be the first speaker, and you've managed the mission very well. You've uh, identified a whole set of issues in your presentation, and uh, it was on realistic and pessimistic note about what to do with corruption. One hundredth of a percent of the recoverables, recoverable assets is really very small, but probably this is a realistic assessment. And I believe that uh, your conclusion was very important concerning what to do, to punish, to j put in jail, to talk to them, to fine, to use other measures. This is really a very serious set of measures, and probably I'm putting the horse in front of the cart, but I'll say that the national strategy for countering corruption in the Russian Federation, we have a document like that in this country, states that we in Russia will consecutively take a number of steps. First, uh, we will set up uh, the legislative basis for countering, countering um, uh, corruption, and only then uh, we will use punitive measures. So uh, we are following the paradigm that was suggested by the speaker already. But on the other hand, there's a number of very burning issues related to estimating the level of corruption and a whole block of issues ensuing from that. We have uh, representatives of European Union here, and we all know that during the recent half a year, very interesting processes have been underway in Europe. There was a number of reports on corruption in EU and in separate EU nations. Their governments responded quite differently to those publications, and probably some of our colleagues would like to share their experience of counting corruption in Europe. Although, <coughs> uh, probably we should give the floor to our respected colleague from Iran, so a representative of the judiciary. In the name of Allah, merciful and kind, I would like to thank our friendly Russia for organizing such an important event. I represent the judicial authority of the Islamic Republic of Iran, and I thank the Ministry of Justice of the Russian Federation for organizing such an important event. The topic of countering corruption 
is one of the major issues uh, for the whole global community. A lot of problems are rooted in human nature and some of those roots of those problems are beyond the nature of humans. Without any doubt, selfishness and uh, haughtiness of man makes him desire more profit for himself. And there are bad people, bad guys, and who are devils, who facilitate and who facilitate corruption and involve other people in corruption. Allow me to say a few important and basic words of how we solve those problems based on the religion and the structure of a country. I will give you four mechanisms of all ways of solving this problem. If you have any other opinions about that, I will be ready to listen to them. The first one is the control and the issue of ethics and morality. If people or communities are not thinking about controlling themselves and being sure of uh, the Lord who is following their actions, they will be susceptible to corruption. The best mechanism of countering corruption is self-control. Wherever a person is, if a person is alone, he or she must control themselves, and if they are in society, they must be certain that all their actions are seen uh, by the Supreme Lord. So, first of all, they must control themselves. Uh, those who deal with ethics, uh, morality, and spirituality are certain of the fact that people must be able to control themselves. The second mechanism or the second approach is the project for total control. All the strata of society, all the people in society must feel that they have certain obligations. One of the basic principles in our constitution and in our religion is to call for the good and to turn away from the evil. 
and this is one of the basic principles so that all the people in the society understand their obligations related to the, each other and to the society. The third is the more active uh, part played by the executives, being that of the counting chamber or any other. If the agencies of control are more serious about this, there is no need to use the judiciary. If those mechanisms, uh, the mechanisms of the controlling agencies and of the authorities are serious, are more proactive in these issues, there will be no need for the judiciary to deal with this subject. Uh, fourthly, it is a tough attitude to corruption, to the people involved in corruption, so that uh, later they can no, not pursue corruption any longer. Unfortunately, it sometimes happens that the weak people who are involved in corruption are being taken to court and sued. But we mustn't forget the strong people, the mighty people who's, who are in the background, who stand behind them. Unfortunately, big transnational companies and other companies evade. They're not being punished, and uh, the simple people are taken to court. Islam is a religion that stresses that one must not allow the poor people uh, to be punishable and the rich being impunitive. With your permission, I would like to share my other thoughts with my colleagues. Unfortunately, it sometimes happens that some corruption cases take so much time that the details of crime, the elements of crime are being forgotten. So it's very important to investigate such cases as soon as possible. And the punishment may be very efficient it mustn't be postponed. I would like to extend my gratitude for listening to me to the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. A very well-structured and interested presentation of your views on the reasons of corruption and the measures of countering corruption. I believe that everyone present will agree to the main thesis that the main method of countering corruption is uh, the self-control of a person. I'm sincerely grateful for this uh, idea. I share it. I represent a specialized subdivision 
of the President's uh, Office on Countering Corruption in Russian Federation, I can say that the main element of Russian countering corruption is this idea. Turning to the person forming intolerance to corruption in the society. I would like also to thank you very much for presenting the views of a person who really knows what corruption is, who deals ca with cases on corruption. Thank you very much. Dear friends, uh, we are continuing our discussion. I've already said uh, that we would be very interested in the European view, in the view of a civilization and a socium which may apply different approaches. Oh, thank, please. Mr. Mitrich, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for giving me the possibility uh, to speak to this forum. Uh, my name is Dietrich Neumann. I'm the head of legal affairs of the European Police Office, in short, Europol. Um, I might have to disappoint you because I can't, um, and I also won't, give you a general overview of anti-corruption matters um, of the EU. But what I can offer you, and uh, the clicker might be available. Yes, thank you. What I can offer you is uh, some sort of um, uh, microcos micro uh, some sort of anecdotal evidence uh, that within the microcosmos of uh, Europol, um, anti-corruption measures do work. I would like to start with uh, maybe a little bit of, of history. Uh, corruption is a phenomenon um, that wasn't regarded as such some 300 years ago throughout the civil services of uh, European states. In fact, government officials then had a basic salary, and if you had a request as a citizen, you went to the public official and you had to pay a certain fee for obtaining the service that you wanted to have. Now, um, in Germany, uh, in the 18th century, um, uh, there was uh, a king, the king of Prussia, Frederick, Frederick, Frederick the Great II, um, who was inspired by the philosophical movement of the Enlightenment. Um, uh, he set up an independent judiciary, and there's a nice little anecdote connected to that. Um, uh, the king had a castle, and in the castle, uh, the castle had a park, and in the park there was a windmill. And the the king wanted to extend the park, um, so he wanted to make the park bigger, so he asked the mill to be removed. Uh, now the miller, um, the owner of this mill, um, he constantly refused to do so. In the end, the king went himself to the miller and said, listen, you need to remove the windmill. And the miller said, majesty, you could do this, but there is the independent judiciary, the royal court, um, that will prevent you from doing so. The king was so impressed by this answer that he let the mill where it was, and it is still visible in the park of Potsdam. Now that certainly was um, a, a certain shift of paradigms, because this king uh, set up uh, an independent um, and comparatively well-paid civil service. So this is the, uh, the, the first an anecdotal evidence that a shift of paradigms when it comes to corruption is possible. The second uh, uh, anecdotal evidence that I would like to offer you is um, the microcosmos of my organization. Um, and I have chosen the example of public procurement because public procurement is one of the areas where you certainly um, find yourself being prone to corruption. Within uh, my organization, we have 30 million euros to spend annually, roughly, for the procurement of goods and services. Um, uh, one of the challenges uh, is certainly the relationship between the public official and the supplier. 
Of course, this relationship needs to be fairly reasonable when it comes to implement any contracts that you have concluded uh, with the supplier, but it is uh, critical that there is a certain distance between the public official and the supplier during the stage of public procurement, during the stage of tendering, the stage of obtaining the contract. Um, in order to um, uh, see this happening, um, there's a very complex procurement framework uh, that we have to um, abide by. Um, this procurement framework aims at ensuring um, getting the best value for money um, and uh, also offering all competitors a leveled playing field. Um, we also have to um, bear with and uh, count on intensive auditing of our organization. Um, that's also a challenge uh, I will uh, come back to later. And last but not least, of course, you also have uh, operational needs. The public procurement framework uh, that uh, we have to apply is geared towards the classical EU administration, an administration where, deci where decisions to obtain certain goods and services sometimes can take months, uh, if not even a year. Uh, as a police organization, we need services or goods sometimes very quickly in order to ensure operational success. Now in practice, how does this work? I hope you can still read this. Uh, well, there are two elements um, that are important in practice. The first element, and this is classical, um, is the element of prevention. Um, first of all, um, what offers control um, are the procurement processes. Um, like every EU agency, we have to go through a very detailed process of planning our purchases. Uh, they are enshrined in an annual work program and only if they are, they are in the annual work program then the budget is allocated to uh, the objectives and to the goods and services that we want to procure. Secondly, we have to be very specific about what we want to buy. Um, by doing so, you prevent that um, goods and services are bought ran randomly or um, from the preferred supplier. Thirdly, there are selection panels um, uh, that are composed um, by different or from different actors that ensure uh, the greatest possible um, and neutral selection. And thirdly, we are controlled by the European Court of Justice. So any supplier who is not selected can bring us to court. And there are cases, we have currently cases running, where suppliers went to court and um, uh, want to obtain a decision that uh, our decision to procure something was unlawful. Um, the internal workflow. We work with a four or even six eyes principle, so important decisions are um, checked by not only two pair of eyes, but by four pair of eyes or six pair of eyes. So up to three different people are involved. We have an internal independent auditor that regularly checks our processes. We have annual external audits uh, by the European Court of Auditors. And in the end, our director, who is responsible for the implementation of the budget, needs to be discharged by the budgetary authorities, that is the European Parliament and the Council of the European Union. It has happened that in other agencies, the director of this agency's agency did not get the discharge and consequently had to leave his post. So these are very serious mechanisms. Um, the second element is the element of investigation. Um, uh, that has two forms, internal is investigations which are followed by disciplinary sanctions and external investigations for which we have um, an office that fights internal fraud within the EU. Um, so these processes work well. We had a case of um, internal corruption in 2002 um, that was discovered and followed up um, and the person involved um, uh, spent some time in jail. Of course there are issues. 
like with any system. Um, the first issue is the balance between uh, accountability and operational flexibility. Uh, sometimes colleagues complain that this process uh, involves too much red tape, that it is over-controlled. Well, to a certain degree, uh, degree I would agree. Um, it is a process that is very demanding in terms of expertise of the staff that is involved, of the number of, the re of resources that you have to invest, uh, the intensiveness of planning uh, that you have to do, and finally, the control mechanisms that you have to set up. Uh, all of this uh, does not, um, is, is not exactly favorable for a police organization that sometimes has to react very quickly. Let's say if uh, we need very quick replacement for some of our essential IT components and we would have to start a public procurement procedure and we can't find an exception to procure these IT pro uh, components, then we would have to take um, a documented decision that we consciously decide not to follow all these procurement steps but to simply buy what we need in order to keep our IT systems running but it needs to be well documented. So um, the whole process is certainly not issue free. Um, my last slide um, is about some questions answered. Um, for what it's worth, I'm certainly not an expert on, uh, on, on corruption, uh, but I can offer you some, some general ideas. Well, who's to blame for corruption? Business or public officials was one of the questions asked. Um, I would suggest that the wealth of legal countermeasures um, that we find uh, uh, within the public service suggests that it is the public officials um, on whom the focus is put. Um, who can do something against corruption? I would suggest it is mainly the public service. This historical example I've told you about Frederick the Great um, in my mind um, justifies the conclusion that it is very important that corruption is fought at the very top of the food chain of the governmental hierarchical structure. In German, we, Germany we have the saying, the fish always stinks from the head. Secondly, law and ethics, which is more effective? I would say um, ideally law should be the same as the ethics that a society have. Of course, this might, may sound a little bit naive, um, uh, as we all know that this is not always the case. In the end, does it matter? I would suggest not. Law or ethics should match the situation a society wants to find itself in. Not following law or ethics must have consequences, however, be they, uh, sh uh, should they be formal or informal. Then a third aspect which was raised and then uh, I will finish, problems that need organizational and legal solution. Uh, well, it is uh, certainly so that law provides ethics and provides for the structural setup of anti-corruption mechanisms. Uh, organizational measures are equally important. Um, organizational measures need to ensure that the individuals involved in anti-corruption are empowered, that they can do something. This also involves adequate payment. Um, if you are not ready to invest um, in adequate payment of governmental services, if you're not ready to invest in an adequate infrastructure, how can you instill the necessary ethics of your, uh, uh, of your public uh, servants to fight corruption? Uh, there has to be a visible follow-up uh, of breaching the law, um, uh, so uh, it, 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 it should, first of all, it should happen, secondly, it should be visible, and thirdly, um, you always have to walk the talk. There's nothing more destructive than just giving you, you some fancy laws, but not following them through. Um, these were my uh, observations from 
a public official's perspective within the microcosmos of my agency. I hope you find them useful, and I'm, of course, open to any questions you might have. Thank you. Спасибо. Thank you very much. I think you did a very successful uh, follow-up of some of the ideas that were brought up by our colleagues, and I hope that uh, the representatives of NGOs in here or the public uh, will not probably agree with one of the theses that you explained, that it is the government that must lead the way of uh, counteracting corruption. I'm pretty sure amongst those who are present in the audience there are people who are against this thesis, but still, and uh, if still, uh, since I'm also a public official, I believe this is true. Uh, there's a number of other interesting uh, questions you have raised, but uh, can I, you answer a question? There's a thought that uh, mechanisms of counteracting corruption, they uh, impede progress. They limit the growth rate of progress. And uh, in your presentation, you actually voiced the same idea about difficulties in procurement and so on. Do you believe that this idea must be agreed with, or is this idea vicious? And if so, then why? Mr. Dietrich, can you answer this question, please? Um, I can only answer it by giving you my, uh, pers my personal opinion. Um, uh, I would believe that uh, the costs and the, uh, and, and basically we are talking about money here, um, that the costs involved in setting up proper uh, governmental services, so paying your public servants well, ensuring that there's an adequate infra uh, infrastructure that um, uh, the treatment of public officials instilled some kind of pride in them for working for the government. Uh, all of this takes enormous amounts of money. However, the reflux of money um, into a society that has um, an adequate public service that ensures the certainty of law, uh, that ensures that um, all citizens are treated to the extent possible equally, uh, the reflux of money, uh, in my opinion, will be enormous. So it is a huge upfront investment, but it, it is certainly followed uh, by a stable uh, uh, society that is a good place for investing. So in the end, you will have this famous win-win situation. I hope this partially answered your question. Yes, thank you very much. We shall continue our discussion. And now I'd like to give the floor to Baker Stephen, to Stephen Baker, who will share his view on that very serious topic. He will touch upon a question that we haven't yet been uh, discussing in here. Stephen, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this conference. And thank you very much for the contributions from the previous speakers. <coughs> There's a central theme I think which we're all agreed upon, which is that with corruption we're dealing with the most difficult of the bad human characteristics because we're dealing with greed and we're also dealing with power and that makes the issue hugely difficult. <coughs> I first want to um, answer the question, why am I here? Uh, I'm an English lawyer, but I'm also a Jersey lawyer, and that is old Jersey, not New Jersey, the American state. It's old Jersey, which is a little island which lies off the coast of France. And many of you here will know of it or of islands like it, which are called offshore centers or fiscal paradises, depending on where you come from. Well, those of us who live in Jersey call ourselves a well-regulated, low-tax area. But the reason that I am here is that traditionally, corrupt people have hidden their assets offshore. And that's given me the great privilege 
to act for several countries, including Brazil, Kenya, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, and Nigeria. I worked as a government lawyer for two years before I went back into private practice. And so I have particular views and experience as to whether the better way of recovering assets is by using what we call the civil system, using private lawyers, or using state powers and the criminal law. Ed's talk was a little bit, Ed Davis's talk was a little bit depressing because why don't we all go and become corrupt because there's no chance of being caught. But I want to give you an example, if I may, of a case in which very substantial assets were recovered. And the message from the case I'll talk about is this. Firstly, a victim state needs to have the political will to get the money back. If a victim state does not want the money back, then they will not get the money back. And in this regard, we come, we come to the problems of greed and power, because very often the information that a former politician holds money offshore is more important than getting the money back, and that's a very serious problem. My second point is that the civil process and using private lawyers, in my experience, is the better course. There are many reasons for that, but one very obvious reason is that if the state acts, the state has to prove the case against people beyond reasonable doubt, whereas in the civil process, there's a lower burden of proof, namely the balance of probabilities. Another message from me would be that in order to succeed, there has to be proper international cooperation between nations, and nations have to look for solutions, not, not to the problems which they will face, because there will be many, many problems, because often the person who is under investigation will be very wealthy, very powerful, and will instruct lawyers all over the world to defend the case. I have many, many slides, and I would love to have the opportunity to talk to you at length about the case, which involves so much of my time, but I can't. So I'm going to take you to some key slides, and I hope um, allow you to get a sense of how you can achieve the recovery of assets. So I'm going to flick through my slides. That's a structure, but too, too long. The case I'm going to talk about is the Federal Republic of Brazil against Durant International Corporation. Durant International is a British Virgin Islands company. And this case involved the former mayor of Sao Paulo, Paulo Malouf, and it involved the theft of public money during the construction of a motorway called the Avenue Espreda in Sao Paulo. And 13.5 million, that should be dollars, was um, stolen from Brazil over a period of just about four weeks. My point is, this was one public works contract, and this was what the mayor stole in four weeks. He was in power for many years, and in Brazil, there's a case outstanding against him still, which is for about 1.5 billion US dollars. So we were doing the baby part of the case in Jersey. That's the, the fraud structure, which I'm going to talk you through until the, until the um, chairman tells me I've got to stop. But first, let's have a look at the man. That's the flesh, the very corrupt person. He was mayor from 93 to 96, and he continued stealing after he left power. In Brazil, the word Maluf, his surname, is used to mean to steal. So to Maluf is to steal. And he ran uh, for election. He's still a politician. He ran for election in Brazil, and his campaign slogan was, I may be a thief, but I get things done. 
So that's what we're facing. Let me talk you through this slide because it shows how complicated the schemes can be. And also, it shows that you need very clever lawyers, bankers, and accountants to put together these schemes. If you look at what I hope is the top left-hand corner of the slide, you'll see EMERB. EMERB is a public company in Sao Paulo which paid for public works contracts. Mendes Jr. below it is a very big engineering company in Brazil. EMERB would pay Mendes Jr. theoretically to build a motorway. They paid out very, very large sums of money to Mendes Jr. on invoices raised by Mendes Jr. Mendes Jr. then pretended to make payments to subcontractors. Most of the subcontractors did absolutely nothing on the motorway. In fact, a man in Mendes Jr.'s office had checkbooks of the subcontractors, so he would write out checks from Mendes Jr. to the subcontractors, and at the same time, he would write checks, blank checks, checks without a, a payee in, on the subcontractors' accounts. And for those of you who are going to host a World Cup shortly, you may want to have a look at this one, because it's a very good way to steal from construction contracts. Money was then transferred by an unofficial banking system called Dolieros. Um, some of you will be aware of Hawala banking, it's the same sort of thing. But money was transferred into bank accounts in New York, and the New York accounts were in code names. That's Chinani, do you see the Chinani accounts and the, the account numbers below? From there, the money was transferred to bank accounts in Jersey. Um, and they went into a company called Durant, and then into a company called Kildare. And then you see the, the, all those boxes at the bottom? Those are unit trusts, which were created by bankers in Jersey. And the money then, or much of the money, went back. Do you see the company Yucatex at the bottom left-hand corner? I hope you're all following me. Um, that's back into Brazil. And that's a public company traded upon the Brazilian stock market. So what Maluf had done is effectively stolen from the people of Sao Paulo and then through a complicated structure reinvest back into a company traded on the Brazilian stock market, hiding the fact that he was investing. He was the main uh, shareholder in the company anyway. So he there committed another fraud upon the people of Brazil. So this is, one of, this is one of my favorite frauds, if you can have that sort of thing. So that was the structure. How did we get the money back? Well, there was criminal investigations in Jersey, New York, and Brazil into Malouf and his associates for offenses of money laundering, effectively dealing with the proceeds of corruption. There were mutual cooperation between Jersey and Brazil and Jersey and the United States. Letters of request for mutual assistance were sent. Assets were frozen. There were a huge number of challenges by Malouf to the decisions to send material to, to Brazil and the decisions not to show him the letter of request. But what happened? Well, in the United States, Malouf and his son Flavio have been charged with money laundering red notices have been issued through Interpol, which means that they will be arrested if they leave Brazil. They don't like that because these rich people, however big their wine cellar is in Brazil, however sophisticated their life is in Brazil, they want to come to London, they want to come to Monte Carlo, they want to go to the United States, but they can't because they'll be arrested and prosecuted in the United States if they do. In Jersey, Brazil sued the two British Virgin Island companies for being knowingly concerned in the theft from Brazil. And this is the point which Ed raised, that we didn't sue Malouf for the money. There would have been great problems in doing that. Instead, 
we sued the two offshore companies which they had used in order to um, steal the money. We obtained disclosure orders from Jersey. One of the odd things you might find is that you can find much more information in offshore centres than you would expect. So information was received from Jersey. Freezing orders were obtained and there was a trial. The trial was very interesting because almost all of the witnesses for Brazil were very serious criminals. The employees from the engineering company, Mendes Jr., all made witness statements. And the reality was that in their witness statements, they admitted criminality, which in many systems would have, allowed, would, would have had them sentenced to very long sentences of imprisonment, 10, 20 years worth of imprisonment. So they didn't want to come to Jersey to give evidence. But we were able to read their witness statements and that's another example of why the civil process was better than the criminal process with the state running the case, because it's highly unlikely that the witness statements would have been able to be read in a criminal case, whereas in a civil case where property is being taken from a person, it's easier to get permission from the court to read the statement. So they, the, the statements were read and judgment in favour of Brazil was given with compound interest, which took the judgment to about 30 million US dollars, and that money has been repaid to Brazil. This took a very long time. This case has been going on since the late 1990s. The case in Brazil still goes on. So the country who is seeking the money back has to be in this for the long term. And many, many times what you see is that the country, the state, loses interest or there's a change of government and a change of political allegiances and cases fail. So I hope I've given you an example of a case which has succeeded. I'll very briefly finish by saying, saying this. In, in Jersey, this little offshore island, there have been hundreds of millions of US dollars um, paid back to Nigeria. There's been many um, tens of millions paid to Pakistan. As regards Kenya, a Kenyan government minister and a, a Kenyan businessman await extradition from Kenya to Jersey. Now, whether Kenya has a strong enough legal system to ensure that a former minister and a businessman are extradited to this little island off the coast of France, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. But what may surprise you is that those places which were once seen as um, good places to hide money are actually pretty good at getting it back. And places like Jersey and Switzerland in truth, have done a lot more to combat corruption than places like the United Kingdom where you might expect the opposite to be the case. That's what I like to say. Thank you, colleague. That's true. Corruption and money is one and the same thing. These are not two things, but one and the same thing. And uh, it has been repeated here a number of times, and I'd la rather quote the presenter uh, that it works. And uh, it is interesting because we should do something about it. We cannot go bo beating about the bush. And as far as the assets are concerned, certainly we should focus on recovering them, but when we prepared the Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime and we wanted to include a section uh, counteracting corruption, our delegation wanted to lay down the idea that it is a must to recover the money and give, them, give it back to the country of origin, but there were a lot of technical problems. 
And during a break, a colleague of mine from France approached me and he had a very nice picture in the journal and it was signed that this is the property of a Russian citizen. And he asked me, do you want us to give it back to you? No, nobody wants to give money back. That's a serious problem. But I think it was quite interesting uh, that this is a kind of an objective reality and we have to deal with it. And in Vienna, about two years ago, we discussed the problem of recovering assets. And an example was given of seven million dollars, seven million euros. And instead of this, they returned one euro to pay for the lawyers. Uh, that's just my kind of a bridge to the next presenter a matter of the recovering assets. Perhaps Mr. Redruer will share his experience. As far as I know, he is involved in it. Uh, I'm a lawyer from Brazil. Um, I do a lot of uh, international asset recovery. Uh, mainly in bankruptcy in Brazil, when there is a, a fraud, a, diver, a diversion uh, of assets, we step in. And so far, the last, four, the last couple of years, we were able, with our, our team, to freeze around $1.5 billion of, dollars of diverted assets. Uh, <clears throat> these days, uh, I was talking to a higher authority from Brazil about this talk about corruption and how we can prevent it. <clears throat> and we, we end up with the, the conclusion that it is impossible to avoid bad people to be in power. Like Maluf, like our, our friend Steven was talking about, uh, Maluf is a well-known corrupt politician in Brazil. For a long time, everybody knows this, and he keeps, he, he keeps being elected. In 2008, I was in New York talking up with uh, Adam Kaufman, which is a New York prosecutor, and he asked me, listen, I'm from New York, I'm trying to get my Luffy, I get him in Interpol, what are you guys is doing over there? I said, well, we, we keep him elected, you keep electing him, that's something that is a cultural issue. So, in the end of, of this discussion about how to combat corruption, we end, we end up with the the idea that you have to create a scenario that disencourage the people to do bad things with uh, like corruption. You have to be strong with the criminal side, <clears throat> but that's not enough. You have to be very strong on the civil side, uh, getting the money back divert, di diverted, but not only the money back that, that was diver di diverted, but um, the damage they cannot be uh, the, the, the amount that the person who is still by, on the corruption that he has to, to, get, to give back has not be, cannot be measured by the benefit that the agent got. The measure has to be another one, has to be uh, much more extensive. We have a, a very good example of how to combat corruption in Brazil when you talk about bankruptcy. Uh, the Brazilian judiciary create uh, some precedents since 2011, 2011 by the Supreme Court, which some is, is uh, held liable a third party who helped the, the a third party who helped di divert money from a bankruptcy state can be held liable for the whole debt of the state, not only the diverted assets. It's a patrimonial confusion uh, concept. And this, I can tell you that uh, really disencourage people on helping, assisting the diversion of money on, 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 uh, on, the, on the bankruptcy state. But uh, so it's, uh, it's not, uh, if you have a, in order to create this scenario, it's not only enough to have a good, a good, uh, a good tool, a, 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 good, a, a good legislative uh, bill. You have to, 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 to act. So once 
once you find a, a act of corru a corruption, how to react? You have to react fast. You have to react strong. And how you we dealt with this in Brazil regarding the corruption inside the bank corruption states? Why we didn't do this before? <clears throat> we didn't do this before going internationally uh, to, to get assets because you didn't have the money to do it. Normally, the states, the bankruptcy states, does, they, uh, doesn't, have, doesn't have cash in their account. So we create a scenario where we were able to get funding and work on the contingency fees for the states. And that's how we solve the issue. So my message here today is that, that I wanna, I wanna leave with you, <coughs> is that we have to create a scenario to disencourage people of, 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 uh, be a, of be a part of corruption, of disencourage. And how we do this? Creating a scenario of fear. Thank you. Uh, so can I um, put a question to you? Do you believe that in the scenario which you mentioned, um, the uh, measures of exerting force or uh, persuasion or whatever it may be, what should be resorted to primarily? Our colleagues mentioned here the ideas of ethics, that the ethical aspects should be reinforced. Others said that the state, the government should be stronger and should be taking the lead in the process. So what do you think the priorities would be in such scenarios? No. So, we wanted to discuss very specific issues today, including what should be the priorities, ethics and ethical aspects, or measures of enforcement, of using force, etc. What should be prevailing, the state, the government, or civil society? So, what's your perspective? How do you see it? Uh, for the numbers that we have seen, <clears throat> for my colleague Ed has shown in the, in the, in the, in the slides, we are doing poorly so far. We are recovering 1%, less than 1% of the, of, the, of, the, of the bribe around the world. So I think, we, we, of course, we, we have to, we have to, to create, um, to, to educate better the people, that's for sure. But in, in our side, we have to be very strong on the civil side and you have to, to use special, a specialized team in order to do that. Yes, I think that you have come to grasp with the problem because specialists, professionals, is most important in counteracting corruption and as an official, I confront a lot of laymen when the approaches are not professional at all. Corruption is too complex and it has very different uh, manifestations. And when we started uh, combating corruption several years ago, people believed that one law would be enough to put an end to corruption. So several years ago, we have come to understand uh, how complex the notion of corruption is. It's not easy to combat. So I think that we can go on with our discussion and give the floor to the representative of Italy. Uh, our colleague will tell us about her experience and her view of corruption. You have the floor, please. Madam. It's okay. Okay. Uh, so, first of all, thank you for uh, uh, the invitation. This is uh, one of the most important conferences in the world. So, I am uh, very 
honored uh, to be here. Uh, I apologize for my English and I don't speak Russian. I speak uh, good Italy, Italian, but I think that uh, uh, nobody uh, can understand uh, Italian. Uh, so uh, this is my English. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, is sufficient. Uh, Italy uh, is uh, a small country, but with a big experience uh, in uh, anti-corruption. In the last century, at the end of the last century, a very big investigation uh, involved uh, the establishment. This investigation uh, um, was uh, so-called uh, manipulite, cleaned hands. And uh, this experience, uh, this last experience, uh, um, uh, is uh, the basis uh, for the investigation, the actual investigation. That is, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, very, uh, very proactive for uh, uh, some reasons. First of all, I think that the uh, position uh, of the public prosecutor, I am a public prosecutor, is uh, uh, very important because uh, uh, public prosecutor uh, in uh, our system uh, is uh, independent. Then uh, uh, the uh, investigations uh, are uh, very strong because uh, uh, very efficient are uh, telephone tappings. And uh, uh, in uh, our investigation, uh, some detectives are very, very good in uh, telephone tappings. Then uh, the cooperation, especially with Switzerland, uh, that is uh, near Italy and is a very important place for uh, bribers and for, uh, and for criminals, uh, Italian criminals and bribers. Uh, uh, the cooperation with Switzerland at this moment is uh, very, very good because uh, uh, there is a bilateral treaty uh, and so uh, the, uh, the investigation uh, in Switzerland is, uh, uh, are very proactive. <coughs> then uh, in uh, our system uh, the, there is uh, the uh, uh, legal person uh, liability. That is uh, very, very important because uh, uh, the situations of the individuals uh, can, uh, can be uh, different uh, from uh, the situation of the corporation or the legal persons. So uh, this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this is the contest and uh, I, uh, I, I want to say that uh, I think that uh, uh, in Italy uh, the prevention uh, isn't good. Uh, I, um, uh, I have uh, understood that uh, in other system uh, uh, the prevention ethics uh, are uh, uh, topics. I think that uh, if uh, uh, the uh, investigation uh, uh, are, uh, um, the investigation are uh, so, so large, uh, it's possible that uh, a problem uh, is uh, in, the, in the precedent phase, in the, pre in, in the prevention. Uh, and uh, I, I hope that uh, in the future uh, our situation uh, um, will uh, uh, we, can, uh, we can change because uh, at this moment uh, uh, there are uh, a lot of investigation now uh, in, uh, in Italy, so I think that uh, uh, the situation uh, isn't, uh, isn't good. I, uh, at this moment, uh, uh, I am involved uh, in, a, in, a, in, in one of the few cases uh, uh, of uh, uh, international corruption. It's a big case uh, and uh, at this moment uh, I am not in Milan, uh, but in a small town near Milan, uh, Busso Arsizio, for uh, the trial and investigation uh, uh, about, uh, uh, about uh, this case. But uh, I think that it's better uh, uh, that uh, uh, I don't talk about, about it uh, because uh, is, uh, it is in course. 
I want, uh, uh, I, want uh, I, I think that is important, uh, two or three uh, topics. First, uh, uh, the, consult the consultants. Uh, I think that uh, the role of the consultant is very, very important uh, in uh, uh, international bribery more than uh, in uh, domestic bribery. Uh, because uh, 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 the briber uh, make use of local agents uh, or other people able uh, to approach the foreign official more easily. Uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this person, uh, this, this, uh, this kind of person, the, co the consultant, uh, is uh, uh, present also in, uh, domestic, uh, in domestic bribery, but uh, I think that uh, uh, the role is very, very important in uh, international, international bribery. Sometimes uh, the uh, consultant uh, uh, makes uh, uh, the uh, operation also, uh, uh, also uh, on the control of the flow of the money. And uh, this is uh, very important because uh, um, the consultant uh, is, uh, uh, is a man, is, bus is a businessman uh, that uh, is uh, uh, the link the link uh, between uh, uh, the briber, uh, the officials, uh, uh, the corporation, uh, the bank. Uh, and uh, in my experience, uh, in my experience, uh, uh, the consultant uh, is uh, uh, more willing to cooperate uh, uh, with the public prosecutor than uh, the officials or the, uh, or the bribers. Uh, so uh, uh, I think that uh, it's uh, uh, very important to focalize, uh, um, uh, focalize the, invest the investigation on the consultant. Uh, in Italian, uh, faccendiere uh, is a person uh, is, is a person that uh, uh, for uh, uh, for his job uh, uh, learns uh, a lot a lot of money. Earns a lot of money. Uh, another uh, another important uh, uh, another topics uh, is uh, the uh, uh, plea bargaining. Uh, in my opinion, in my opinion, plea bargaining is uh, a, um, is, is often a good solution in uh, this matter in uh, uh, in anti-corruption uh, because uh, 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 with a plea bargaining uh, is possible uh, uh, a uh, remuneration for uh, for the victim is uh, possible uh, is possible to reach. Uh, uh, a, um, a solution, a solution, uh, uh, a, a fast solution, a fast solution for the case. And uh, I want to, uh, I want to, uh, I want to say about uh, a very important, very important sentence of the human. Of, uh, uh, of the human uh, of the court of human rights, uh, because uh, this uh, fast uh, uh, this fast uh, uh, judgment uh, uh, at uh, at this moment is uh, uh, present in uh, some country, in some system, and absent uh, and absent in other. But uh, I hope that uh, uh, the uh, situation. Uh, 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 just a moment, please. Oh. Uh, European Court of uh, Human Rights uh, has established the compatibility with the, the requisites of fair trials of an alternative form of judgment to the ordinary trial, analogous to the plea bargaining in our system, but to the plea bargaining uh, in the uh, US system or uh, in other system. Uh, a European court, uh, uh, with the, the sentence of uh, uh, 29 April 2014, uh, uh, Togonize 
uh, versus Georgia uh, uh, said that uh, this uh, uh, that this uh, uh, alternative form of judgment uh, is uh, uh, is uh, uh, a legitimate uh, form of judge uh, of form of judgment. So uh, I I think that. Um, uh, as, um, uh, the investigations, uh, uh, the uh, fast, uh, the fast, uh, the, 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 the soon investigation, uh, the fast trial uh, or judgment uh, is uh, uh, is uh, uh, very very uh, important in uh, this matter more than in other because uh, uh, I. Uh, uh, I have listened from uh, previous speakers uh, that uh, in uh, anti-corruption uh, it's very important to move uh, very, very fast, very soon. But I think very soon, uh, not only uh, with the investigation, but uh, also with the judgment. In our system, and, uh, at, uh, finish in, a, in, 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 a, in our system the investigation is uh, very the investigation is uh, very uh, is very fast and uh, I think uh, effective but uh, the judgment the ordinary judgment is too long too long so uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, it's bad that uh, uh, in an important case uh, the solution the judgment uh, is uh, uh, um, after uh, three, four years. Is uh, is uh, uh, three, four years, and uh, the definite judgment, uh, uh, the judgment of, of the Supreme Court, uh, is uh, uh, also uh, more than three or four years. Uh, the peer bargaining is uh, instead uh, a good solution because uh, uh, it's uh, an uh, immediately judgment. Uh, less punishment, but uh, fast punishment is better than more punishment, but too long. Uh, I, I, I apologize uh, for, uh, for my English, and uh, I, uh, I, am, I am finished. Thank you so much. Uh, there was a very interesting uh, idea in your presentation that corresponds to the idea of other co colleagues. The question is about uh, the uh, pro uh, court procedure. 25% of all the corruption cases in Russia deal with bribery of up to 1,000 rubles. That's 25 euros. So the country involves all of this judicial mechanism in the cases worth 25 euros and that involves investigation, the court procedures, the lawyers, the barristers and so on and so forth. So I'm grateful to my colleagues that they are looking for a solution for this problem, possibly for different types of bribes. If we could apply a different uh, court procedures, maybe simplified procedure. So I believe that uh, practitioners, at least in Russia, should further differentiate the responsibility for bribery. A few years ago, uh, we had, uh, we graded bribes into four types rather than two types that we had had previously. But I think we shouldn't stop with that. And I believe that uh, we should consider a bribe of up to 10,000 rubles. And so the punishment should be different. And uh, the court procedure, the investigation should be simplified. And probably uh, there will this will f be followed by a number of other developments. So I'm very grateful to the uh, last speaker and to other colleagues who touched upon this topic. At the same time, we are gradually moving towards a different stage in our proceedings. 
In the first part, we gave the floor to our foreign colleagues. We presume that us Russians uh, meet quite often, and I'm glad to welcome all the Russian professionals uh, in this room. I'm glad to see them here. So we meet more often. I would like to pass the floor now to a person who is one of the leading experts in Russia in counter-corruption. He uh, used uh, to uh, lead the Russian delegation in OSCE, and that's when the Rus Russia joined the OSCE Convention on uh, countering bribe bribing foreign civil servants. He is uh, the head of the Association of Lawyers of Russia, and he specializes in countering corruption. Because of his professional duties, he also deals with investigating criminal cases on bribery. And I'll tell you the truth, he is a good old friend of mine, Alexander Fedorov. Please, would you share your ideas about the subject of this conversation? Thank you, Valentin, for such a bright presentation, esteemed colleagues. I believe when I thought uh, about how to structure my presentation at this forum, I decided that the subject is inexhaustible. It's a global subject, and I would like to choose one aspect that could stay with you, that could fuel a discussion, and I decided uh, to continue on the uh, subject of yesterday's uh, discussion uh, in this room about the world legal institutions, and I would uh, rather uh, use uh, the presentations of my foreign colleagues as a springboard for what I will be talking. And I will be talking about criminal liability of legal entities. We're talking about corruption in business. And it is in business that corruption and bribery is affected for the interest of certain legal entities, I mean companies and corporations, and we can split corruption into everyday life corruption and economic corruption. So I would like to talk about corruption in business. And one of the most efficient tools to counter this type of corruption is the criminal liability of legal entities. I can say that over 50 countries of the world have that liability, especially those countries which have market economy. Naturally, in the Soviet times, uh, you could not even talk about such responsibility in the Soviet Union. Now we've entered uh, an epoch of uh, market relationships, and this issue has become vital. More than that, it seems to me that uh, the issue of uh, introducing the notion of criminal liability for corruption is related to the changes that have happened in this country. Why? Because uh, the crime of a physical person uh, really moves back and the legal entity comes to the forefront because it's the, most of the legal entities uh, that get the proceeds of their criminal activity. While meeting uh, the business community and discussing this topic with them, I was very much surprised, and then I realized it was true. I heard them supporting of this proposal, because business must develop under the conditions of normal market relationships. Corruption disrupts normal market relationships, relationships and impedes the development of a business. When discussing countering corruption in business, we must look for our allies 
in businesses because they are the ones who are interested in developing normal market economy. I can say there's a number of international conventions which uh, Russia joined providing for criminal liability of legal entities and Russia has already made some steps towards that. In particular, uh, we introduced uh, administrative uh, liability for uh, corruption. Uh, this is the famous Article 1928 of the Administrative Code. It was not very easy to introduce such liability. There was a lot of uh, questions and arguments about uh, the degree of guilt by the uh, entering by the uh, legal entity. But now uh, we have that Article 1928 that uh, provides the administrative uh, uh, liability for bribery. And that, I think, is extremely important for criminal law, too, because uh, the criminal law is dominated by the concept of the psychological perception of guilt, uh, which excludes uh, the recognition of a crime committed by a corporation. So after this brief introduction, I would uh, come down to something more specific. So what would this criminal liability look like? There's a lot of options, and the simplest that is really on the surface and that doesn't need to radically change the criminal law or the criminal proceedings and investigation. That is the introduction of new articles into the what is called the other measures of criminal nature, criminal law nature. Uh, one of such measures could be the specific responsibility by the legal entities. <coughs> so why isn't it enough to have the administrative liability? There's a number of conventions that offer civil or administrative liability by the corporations for acts of corruption. And we've heard a number of presentations today where the speaker said that civil liability is very effective and administrative liability is very effective. Maybe that is so in other countries. As for Russia, I believe that administrative liability of legal entities has its pros and cons. And I would specify seven positions of which show that administrative liability of corporations are for bribery is not always efficient. In administrative cases, there is no comprehensive investigation. The administrative process is intended to uh, consider our cases which are considered much less dangerous than uh, criminal acts. And usually the investigation is at the level of the justice of the peace. And the question is how qualified is the justice of the peace to assess uh, the actions of a legal entity. And when we talk to businesses, they agree that within a criminal process there is more possibility to provide for the rights of legal entities if they are, if a legal action is taken against them. Uh, in administrative cases, uh, there is no 
operative investigation. It's only possible in criminal cases, and that reduces the efficiency of such process. Thirdly, the breach of law by uh, the legal entities uh, come uh, into light usually uh, when in the process of a criminal investigation against physical persons. And the investigation would be much more efficient if those two processes were combined. Right now the situation is as follows. Bringing uh, legal entities to justice only starts when a physical person is convicted and sentenced and the prosecutor brings the uh, appropriate documents uh, to the court and starts an administrative procedure. I have analyzed this practice and I can say that the overwhelming majority of the cases are like that. Apart from that, a practice shows that when the liability of physical persons and legal entities for interconnected interconnected actions are regulated by different branches of law, the situation is uh, just like too many cooks spoil the broth. In administrative cases, actually, there is no uh, international collaboration. International treaties and agreements are oriented towards collaboration in criminal cases. Fifth, something that was already mentioned today. The introduction of criminal liability for the legal entities ensues from the obligations undertaken by the Russian Federation in a number of international conventions whose signatory it is and which were ratified by Russia without any caveats. And those are not only anti-corruption conventions. I took a special attention uh, at, uh, to other conventions. For instance, it's a convention on the uh, chemical weapons of, of uh, 1993, which provides criminal liability by the legal entities for a number of activities. Sixthly, in my opinion, and this is a very serious argument to my mind, it uh, seems illogical for Russia when foreign agencies will be able uh, to start criminal cases against Russian citizens while Russia will only be able to use the tool of administrative liability that puts us into an equal, an equal position compared to other countries. And the seventh layer uh, something that is very close to us, because we live in the post-Soviet area, the criminal liability for uh, the um, legal entities has been introduced in Azerbaijan, Lithuania, Latvia. It's very much discussed in Kazakhstan and other countries. Uh, Kazakhstan is very actively debating this and it seems that the Russian Federation shall not uh, be aloof of the processes uh, that go on in the world and should uh, take a careful look at uh, what is written about the criminal liability of corporations in foreign legislations. This will facilitate countering corruption in business. This will facilitate the formation of a, an effective market economy and will not only protect the uh, interest of the state, but also protect the interests of fair entrepreneurs who work in our market. This will provide additional capabilities to counter such a negative phenomenon as bribing foreign civil servants and officials, which 
actually complies with our obligations on the OSCE convention. And I would like to attract your attention to the following. They often say that we must do this because this is provided for in international conventions. Actually, this is not quite so. Joining a convention, we uh, presumed uh, there would be a normal development of economic uh, relationships. And when ratifying those conventions, uh, we acted in the interest of developing economy. So the objective reasons for introducing criminal liability for corporations lies in the processes that happen in economy. And the fact that we are parties to those conventions is just one of the pretexts to tackle the issue of introducing such liability. It seems to me it's very important to discuss this issue, in particular at such representative fora involving experts from other countries, because one may take a decision, but it's important that the decision gets support among the legal community, among the business community, and it's very important to form the corresponding public opinion, to reveal the whole range of opinions, so that the legislative tools of countering uh, corruption is really efficient, is well favored by the society, and would take into account all the negative scenarios, because this is like a surgical operation where which do not allow any mistakes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander, for such a um, uh, bright presentation of your idea. Such a vivid presentation of your idea. I'm, uh, I'm more pragmatical. I believe that we have to continue to develop administrative liability of legal entities. And that is needed for a number of reasons. When we speak about criminal responsibility, the word criminal is the key word in here. What is a criminal liability and what is administrative liability? Because the amount and the range of measures used and implemented in both cases is similar. And if we analyze a whole range of other theses, um, around the idea that uh, Vyacheslav has uh, talked about, I think the problem here would be that today there is no monopolism of investigating the single act, meaning a bribe on behalf of the legal entity. Because it's the investigative committee of uh, the Ministry of Interior that deals with private entities and for legal entities, uh, there are separate procedures. And today we divide these two types of liabilities. But if we unite that all, if you unite that in one proceedings, uh, it won't lead to any reduction in corruption. It will even uh, make the whole case worse. Everything else that you have said about, I think it can be resolved uh, in the framework of the criminal proceedings and administrative proceedings. We can definitely expand the participants of our lawyers in the administrative proceedings, that's okay, but now you say about uh, the length of cases in administrative um, proceedings, six months today, maybe we can expand that. As for the national plan on counteracting corruption, for our foreign colleagues I will explain that each two years on a biennial basis we adopt a document uh, which is called the national plan on counteracting corruption on, and we have a current and incumbent national plan and it provides for a number of measures to 
make administrative liability more stringent. But there is a positive dynamics that we can see. If just uh, one and a half year ago, 40% of all administrative cases uh, in accordance with 1928 article were mainly applied to physical entities, now it's about 80%. So Vyacheslav is really right in this case. Um, we see this trend. But um, we must account for the following fact. Vyacheslav, how many are there cases uh, dealing with the liability of legal entities? Hundreds. And will all those hundred cases be transferred to the criminal code? Well, we need to look at the f foreign practice, at the foreign experience best Western practices, because there's a number of definitions of uh, acts uh, which entail a criminal liability, and the legal entity can be brought to justice for doing any type of crime. Even in England there's a case when a legal entity has been uh, brought to justice for a murder, and the charges um, it was charged with murder. And in a number of countries there is a certain reservation. What kind of charges can be used to bring a legal entity to criminal justice? To my mind, the most feasible process will be the following way. We need to move in a step-by-step -step way and we need to try and test this new institution and this new idea um, for some of the corruption cases. Now, as for the administrative liability, together with our General Prosecutor's Office, we have analyzed all practice that exists of uh, bringing to justice legal entities for uh, corruption. We have analyzed the statistics for 2011 and for 2012. And what we've got at the end, in 2011, we have charged with administrative liability 27 legal entities and in 2012 there were 60 legal entities that we brought the charges against. And the average sum of money involved, well, 60 entities were fined for 69 million rubles, meaning 1 million for each. So each of the conviction amounted to at least 1 million. But you really need to find out what kind of case it is. In each case you have to deal with each case you have to deal individually and uh, very often the bribe we're dealing is not economic uh, is not something grand but is actually more mundane. Let me give you a traditional example. Imagine a federal migration service officer comes to a certain shop or a certain retail institutions. He checks what kind of employees are there, he finds foreigners and the, he sees that these foreigners are not registered, they don't have the permits. Then the manager of the shop tries to bribe this officer of the Federal Migration Service, say 5,000 rubles, so that this officer would let them be. Uh, the officer reacts in a proper way. As you know, the employee of the shop is being brought to justice and definitely charged with the attempt to bribe. And as soon as the conviction, as soon as the um, court ruling takes place, this legal entity in an administrative um, law is uh, fined for one million rubles. But this is not the kind of corruption for which we have the criminal liability for legal entities institutes. This institute, this institution is needed to counteract various crimes related to um, more bigger scales, to economy type of crimes. When large corporations with large companies, when they do bribing, have to be brought to justice and definitely fined for not just millions of rubles, but millions of dollars and euros. Because this can also serve as a prevention. It can also serve um, 
as a, a lever, as a leverage to stop these companies from using this uh, bribing. We also need to introduce the internal audit system. We also need to introduce the compliance system and the system of uh, internal corruption counteraction. The company must itself organize anti-corruption activities in order not to become a victim of a physical entity, of a physical person who, on behalf of that company, will be bribing somebody else. So the company needs to find it out itself and then propose the necessary measures. So as far as I gathered, we can have in parallel both the administrative and the criminal liability. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Now, dear friends, when we talk about counteracting corruption, we must not forget about the rights, about our own rights, the right for leisure, for example, because the time has arrived, our most favorable time in any event, which is the coffee break. Because any agenda, in any agenda, I really like this very item, the coffee break. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's move on to the most favorite item on our agenda, the coffee break. We break for 30 minutes, the coffee break is served at uh, the second level, there's tea and coffee, and I would like to see everyone in here in half an hour, in particular the speakers. Please uh, try not to be late. We will reconvene in 30 minutes. Thank you.